someone uses your full name and you're not expecting it. So Chris very rarely says Richard, so I'm kind of thinking, what have I done? But there's a bit of a problem when you routinely will introduce yourself as Rich or Richard or something, not something else, nothing else. That you get yourself into these kind of problems that you're then still expecting when someone uses your full name, you've done something wrong. But I think I'm all right. I'll stop waffling. Acts chapter 9. We're going to look at Acts chapter 9. And we're going to follow on from where Blessan took us last week. We're going to start uh, in verse 19. I'm going to start part way through the verse in verse 19 uh, and go through until verse 31. So what do we read there? In Acts, 19, in Acts 9, verse 19, Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who caused havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name, on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. Okay, we're following on from Paul's incredible meeting with Jesus on the road on the way to Damascus, which Blessam was telling us about last week uh, and how Paul, he was blinded, he was led into the city, but he's, he's met with Jesus and then Ananias is sent to go and pray for him. He's filled with the spirit and he's able to see again. Well, this is what happens next. And in fact, this is quite a short telling of what could be quite a fairly long story. There's potentially, or well, I immediately see it, potentially 10 or 12 years of Paul's life covered here. Between God meeting him on the Damascus road, as we heard last week, and Barnabas calling him to Antioch in chapter 11, which we'll read, we'll get to in a, in a little while. This is what we hear about Paul. And we can piece together some of the story, looking at some of the things Paul writes himself in Galatians 1 and 2 Corinthians 11, which we might come to in a bit. But as we look at these verses, we see Paul. Saul, I'm going to do as best I did and use those words interchangeably. I'll see if I've got any consistency. We'll probably go back and forth. But we see him effectively as a brand new believer. A new disciple whom God has met dramatically. We started this year with Ben encouraging us about us being disciples. And as we are being disciples, we're making disciples. So what do we see here when we read about Paul? What can we learn about being disciples? 
Because you see, whether our conversion was dramatic or not, whether we've had this incredible dramatic moment and like Paul did or not, whether long ago or really recent, if we're in Christ, we are disciples too. We're following him. And actually today, if you're, if you're here and you're not already following him, you're here today, you're not yet a disciple. Then the invitation is here for you today. You see, we're following on from this glorious moment where God met, Jesus met Paul and turned his life completely around. Well, that can be the case for you today. Whether it seems so utterly dramatic as Paul or not, it can be that decisive a moment. As you've been with us, as you've been listening and joining in with the songs, as you're hearing these words from the Bible now, you can know him. Your life can be turned around. Your life can be changed today. I encourage you, as we go through this, listen to him. Listen for him speaking to you, nudging you, showing you the truth that you need a saviour. However good or bad or otherwise you might think you are, you need a saviour and there is one and his name is Jesus Christ. You can know him today, but if we're in Christ, we are disciples. So what can we learn as we look at Paul and these early days and years of his life as a disciple? Well, first thing I'm going to say, disciples are witnesses. That is who we are. How does this start? Paul, Saul, spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't this the man who caused havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name, on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priest? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. At once, at once, Paul is, is out there. This is, this is what's happened to me. This is who Jesus is. I've met with Jesus, now I can't stop telling everyone about him. Disciples are witnesses. We are all his witnesses. It's who we are. Disciples who make disciples. This is Jesus' charge to his disciples. This is what we read in Matthew 28 in the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations. Or as he writes, as he said in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 as well, a similar thing. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It's what he said to his first disciples and it's what he says to us too. All of us. Not just a small group of experts or some people who would call themselves evangelists or would be called evangelists, or, or even preachers who speak from a stage. God calls us to be his witnesses. We've met with Jesus. I want to tell you about him. We've met with Jesus. I want to tell you how good he is. If you're in Christ, he's chosen you to be a witness for him. He can use you. You see, he chose Paul and he used him with his background, his past, his story. He uses his story for the glory of God. We see this so often as Paul writes, for example, in Philippians 3. What's he doing? He's, he's telling how God has met with him and what God has done in his life and who God is. In Philippians chapter 3. And verse 3, for it's we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh, 
though I myself have reasons for such confidence. He goes on to talk about how, how he, he could have, this is what I was like, this is what I did, this is who I was. I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the tribe of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. We'll stop there for now. Paul had a story. Paul had a journey. Paul knew this is what God has done. This is who God is. Let me tell you about him. Let me tell you how I used to be. And this is what God has done. As we talk about being witnesses, Paul's story is powerful. But your story is powerful too. My story is powerful. I could tell you even about the very fact that I'm stood here speaking to you. When I came to university, I was not someone who would stand in front of a crowd. If I really had to, maybe I would. And as I went through the... If, if people don't know, I studied engineering. I went on to do a PhD. I had to go to conferences and present papers. And in one sense, it was fun. We got to go to some lovely places, but I had to stand up and talk. And you're kind of going, Rich, yeah, but you do that all the time. I didn't do it all the time. And it was terrifying. And we could talk about... And we could think about, it's like, what? I'm the last person that I would expect to be up here preaching the word. And yet that's what God has done in me. That's what he's done. That loads of people could tell of similar stories, different stories, different things. I thought I could never do this, and yet this is what God has done. God got hold of me. It's not me, but God is at work. God's done something. God's God changed me. Or God is at work in me. We've all got stories that speak of the power of God who has done so much. Ultimately, in saving us. Your story is powerful. But it's not as dramatic as Paul's rich. That's okay. No, no, you don't understand. I'm just too bad. My backstory is just too terrible. No. Look at Paul, the man who went around persecuting the church, and then look what God has done. At once, Paul was out speaking. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues. You see, Saul, in context, he, had a, he has a front line, he has a platform. He was a Pharisee. He was well respected by the Jews. He was a persecutor of Christians. He was welcomed in the synagogues. So he has a platform and he uses it. And you say, well, well, Rich, not all of us have that platform. In fact, none of us have that particular platform or that context. Not all of us preach from a stage. Not all even preach on a street corner. Not all gather or have the attention of a crowd, but... We all have a context. We all have friends and colleagues. We all have people we rub shoulders with. We all have people that we know. A front line, an opportunity. Where might that be for you? So encouraged by Mary's story this morning. Front line might be at school or at work, in the shops in the park, with your neighbours. It might be in a hospital bed. It might be in a hospital bed and in a situation that you just can't understand. Why am I still here? And then God uses you. Powerfully. As 
we read these verses, we see the, wonder, the, the awesome power of God at work. They're astonished. They're baffled. They can't understand. This guy, this is the guy isn't he the guy who was coming? He was causing havoc in Jerusalem. And he'd come to, to capture the Christians, not be one of them. They're baffled as he, as he, convi- as he, as he shows, he proves Jesus is the Messiah. What's going on? They're, they're astonished. Look at the power of God at work. So we're witnesses. Paul is out there straight away. No need to wait to qualify, to have enough experience or maturity to be a witness. God is the same God. This is the same truth. No need to put it off until all the circumstances are right. It's easy to make these excuses. I can so easily make these excuses. That's for other people. Those people who are far more gifted in that. Oh, yeah, but my circumstances aren't right. If only I had their opportunity. Well, they don't have your opportunity. On the one hand, what are we waiting for? We have a mission field wherever God has put us. And recognise that he has put you there. He's chosen for you to be there at this time. We see at once Paul begins to speak. And yet, as we read verse 23 and we maybe look into some of the other, other accounts, well, Luke just says, after many days have gone by, this intriguingly vague term, one was Suggest is even almost unseen in the passage, there's, there's, a, there's a sense of waiting here. You see, Luke simply says next, after many days have gone by, Paul fills us in potentially with this in his own words in Galatians chapter 1. We're going to see after many days, persecution comes and Paul escapes from the city and goes to Jerusalem. Well, in Galatians 1, Paul perhaps fills us in a bit on, on this time. In Galatians 1 and verse 17. We'll start from this, verse 15. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I didn't go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, before I was but I went into Arabia and later I returned to, to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him for 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brothers. Paul fills us in after many days. Well, three years have gone by. In Arabia and in Damascus before Paul goes to Jerusalem. There's a waiting that's gone on. We see at once Paul begins to speak. But Paul has a huge call of God on his life. What did we read last week? What did we see last week in, in, in chapter 9 and verse 15? The Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Paul's got a massive call on his life. There are massive missionary journeys, incredible missionary stories to come. Yet there are three years here in obscurity. We read a bit, he talked to some guys in Damascus. We've got three years accounted for that are kind of unknown. What happened? Luke doesn't even mention them directly. There's great exploits and missionary journeys to come. Come on, let's go. And yet as witnesses, there is, and as disciples, there is need to know what it is to have patience and to wait. Later we see, at the end of the passage, we see Paul goes off to Tarsus and we hear nothing till Barnabas calls him to Antioch in chapter 11. 
which it's hard to know exactly how long, but some would say it's possibly seven or eight years later. We're called to be witnesses. You might know, you might have heard from God, you might think there's a big call on my life or there's, there's stuff that he's promised that I'm waiting for. Big dreams that God has given. Big things that we want to see and we want it now. Perhaps even we can have that sense, Mary, sorry, I'm going to come back to your story again. That sense, yeah, but why am I here? Why am I here? Really, I just want to go home. What's going on right now? I thought you'd said this, God. I thought this is where I was going, and yet here I am. And yet God is always at work. God is preparing you. God is using you where you are, or is ready to use you where you are. There can be preparation, perhaps out of the limelight, perhaps in obscurity, perhaps not known, but God knows and he sees. Trust him. Wait. But as Paul shows us, wait actively. Paul's not sitting back and waiting. Paul's out there telling everyone about Jesus. He's stepping out where he is, knowing God said, you're going to go, you're going to go somewhere, but I'm going to work in you right now. So this is the first thing. Disciples are witnesses. Telling others about Jesus. Maybe holding great promises or dreams, but called in the here and now to be his witnesses. Okay. Some other things that will probably be shorter. We'll see. As we continue through the passage, we see that disciples are persecuted. There's a cost to following Jesus. Verse 23. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him, but Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. And it goes on, he came to Jerusalem, and it goes on from there. We see in these verses, Paul goes from hunter to hunted. What a huge contrast to chapter 9 and verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Now in verse 23 and 4, it's him who is hunted. It's him who is, we've got to get him. We've got, to, we've got to stop him. We've got to capture him. The Jews in Damascus turn on him. And we get what is some kind of fantastic action movie escape story going on. It's like, right, Paul is in the city. What's he going to do? The Jews have turned on him. In fact, he will, he'll tell us in 2 Corinthians 11, even the city authorities have turned on him as well. And the, they're all coming to get him. They don't want him. They've got the gates guarded. There's no way out. What's he going to do? One man. Locked in a city. With a few followers around him. What's going to happen next? And we have this crazy event where the gates are locked. There's no way out. There's people coming for him. What's going to happen? I know. We'll get a basket. Put you in the basket. We're lowering them. I don't know what's happening. He's under cover of night. No one can see what's going on. And Paul escapes out of the city. Incredible story told in about three or four words. But it's like, oh yeah, by the way, Paul goes out of the city in a basket. It's like, wow, this is it's like crazy action. But as we read, we see the cost of following Jesus. There is a huge and obvious cost for many in turning to Jesus. We see for Paul, Paul was right on the front foot amongst the Jews saying, no, we're going to stop these followers of Jesus. And in a moment, everything changes and he's on the completely the other side. And suddenly, 
Him who was respected among his peers, respected among his group, respected among the Jews. And he was the one, okay, yeah, Paul, he's taking a real lead here. He's doing a great job. Suddenly, hang on a minute. You're out. We're coming for you now. We're coming for you. You're in trouble. You've lost everything. Paul will talk about this. All these things I gave up, I give them all up for the sake of knowing Christ. But many will know similar things. Maybe people here in this room today, knowing the experience of being disowned. And if not in this room, then certainly around the world, disowned, even attacked or killed by family members, by community members, being thrown out of their community sense of bringing shame on the community. What have you done? If you turn to this, this Jesus, who is he? If you're following the Bible in one year uh, scheme, Nicky Gumbel told the story a few days ago of an Indian man. His family was part of the, the highest caste in the Indian caste system. Right at the top of society. In a sense, he had it all. He became a Christian, almost immediately disowned, lost everything. He's brought shame on his family. There's absolute devastation. Yet Nicky Gumbel talked about him going on to become kind of, uh, he was heading up Alpha for them in India. And he would, he would tell the story similar to Paul. I lost everything and yet I gained Christ. This is worth everything. It's true for many, for many Muslims who turn to Christ, for many in communities that particularly know this sense of shame and honour. But perhaps for many around us too, maybe for you. Perhaps there's been a big price to pay in terms of family and community Previously, Paul could see loved, respected, part of this group. Now, we don't want to know you. It's real for people. But what a great opportunity for the church to be the truly welcoming community of God. The family of God who says, no, we welcome you. You're part of us. We see the cost of following Jesus and we also see as Aaron kind of pointed kind of spoke about a couple of weeks ago the cost of speaking out the cost of being in a place which is hostile to the gospel it's a reality and a growing reality here in this nation and we can read stories where it's very definitely true from around the world but here in a nation that more and more is rejecting God and the truth of his words. There may well be a cost. But it is worth it. Because he is God. And we're called to follow him. So we see from Paul. Being a disciple may well mean persecution. Persecution. It's a cost, but it's so, so worth it. Remembering that song, that new song that we sang just now. Christ our hope in life and death. Unto the grave, what will we sing? Christ he reigns, Christ he reigns. I've forgotten the words and I did have them on my phone. You can look them up later. It talks of eternal hope that he brings. This is beyond anything that anyone can ever do to us. We're in Christ. Okay. Disciples are also part of a body. We're called to welcome those, even those who are not like us, even our former enemies. What do we read? We read at the beginning of the passage that Paul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. And then in verse 26, when he came to Jerusalem, 
he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. Disciples are not lone rangers. We're part of a body, the church of Jesus Christ, his church, connected, connected one to another, connected locally in a local church. It's clear all through this, all through the Bible, the church is a body, a family, brothers and sisters together, a body that are connected can read again and again and again throughout the New Testament, statement after statement, which we call the one another's. That we encourage one another, that we love one another, we forgive one another, we, we bear with one another. What's he talking about? A people who are connected together, serving and being served, encouraging and being encouraged, loving and being loved, forgiving and being forgiven. That's who we are. That's who disciples are. But we see the disciples in Jerusalem are afraid to welcome Saul. Well, we can imagine this. We could probably understand it. Who wants to come? Sorry, Paul. Paul the persecutor. Paul, the guy who's imprisoning us. Paul, the guy who stood there as Stephen was being killed and went, yeah, this is good. Paul wants to come. You can imagine the scepticism and fear. We could perhaps imagine the sense, maybe we can imagine, an enemy arrives at the Jubilee Centre. Perhaps, perhaps someone who's been very outspoken about the church. Perhaps someone who is... Uh, Perhaps a government official who's been very active in, in passing legislation, which kind of, this is, this is against us. What's going on here? Perhaps a journalist who's been, who's been very outspoken about certain subjects. They want to come. Hang on a minute. Why do they want to come? Is this a trick? They say they've turned to Christ. It can happen. It does happen those kind of tricks, but we see Paul is excluded. Until Barnabas takes the risk and steps out and says, I'm coming to see you. I'm going to bring you to the apostles. I can see what God has done in you. and I'm going to welcome you in. Well done, Barnabas. What does it say? They were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and how the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. And so then Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem. Well done, Barnabas. Imagine if he hadn't. Imagine if he hadn't stepped out and said, actually, Paul, I believe you. I believe that God's done a great work in you. I believe your story. Now come, let's bring you in. You're welcome here. You're part of us. Welcoming enemies is hard. <laughs> But see, this is what God does. This is the gospel. In Ephesians chapter 3, a wonderful truth that Paul's talking about, Ephesians chapter 2, sorry. And Paul, Paul himself is talking about Jews and Gentiles and what God has done. He's talking to the Gentiles and saying, look, you were far off, but now you've been brought near. If I can get to Ephesians and chapter 2. And verse 13, he's talking to them about that and he says this, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups, the Jews and the Gentiles, one. 
And it's destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. This is what God does. This is what God has done through Jesus on the cross, tearing down the dividing walls of hostility. Between Jew and Gentile, yes, but between former enemies, who now in Christ are united and are as one. See the disciples. What a bunch. We've got Matthew the tax collector and Simon the zealot. Peter, Andrew, James and John who were all fishermen. Well, we've got the tax collector who used to rip them off. And the zealot who thought any collaboration with Rome is like the worst thing ever. And we've got to get them out and we've got to throw them out. This group who never would have been seen together. Who never would have come. Not just because, well, we just haven't got anything in common really. But because they were enemies. And Jesus brings them together and says, no, no, you're my, you are my followers. You're my disciples. You're brothers together. To love one another. You see, this is the wonderful truth of the gospel. God is calling a people from all backgrounds, all nations, every class, every caste, every language, every tribe, every tongue. People who are very like you, people who are very different from you. Friends, people naturally with nothing in common with one another, and even former enemies, together as the people of God. Nicole, will we be like Barnabas? We're not called to throw off every sense of kind of common sense or wisdom. But will we be welcoming people? Will we go, I think God's done something here. Or like Ananias who heard God and listened and said, really, you want me to go to him? No, I've called him. Okay, God, I trust you. I'm going to go to him. Because we're meant to be a body together, united as his people. Okay, we're coming towards a landing. Disciples multiply. This passage closes with this wonderful statement. We see Paul manages to come into the, the group of disciples in Jerusalem. He meets, as he, he says himself, he meets particularly Cephas, Peter and James. He meets with the apostles. He's, he's preaching in Jerusalem. He's, he's, he's going about talking to people. But then more trouble comes and they get him out. And he goes off to Tarsus. As we say, we don't know how long for, but then we'll hear about Paul later in chapter 11. But this passage then closes with this wonderful statement. The church throughout Judea, verse 31, Galilee and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and were strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. We see all through this passage, Paul's been proclaiming the gospel, looking to see new disciples. And this section closes with this great statement. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it, the church, increased in number. The church grows. And the wonderful thing as we see here, the church grows in all seasons. Compared to some of the statements we've already seen, this one's a bit of a surprise. The church throughout Judea, Galilee and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. We've seen already through the book of Acts, of course, after the crazy and wonderful uh, events of Pentecost, many people were added. But then we see great growth in the face of the arrests of Peter and John. Persecution coming, but growth comes. We see they do many signs and wonders a bit later on and growth comes. We see they have the whole problem with their 
with, the, with that one group of Jews being left out, of, uh, the widows being left out, and, and, and there's a problem there, but also the time with Ananias and Sapphira, and they've had this horrible time, and they've had to deal with this, and the church grows. We see an intense persecution come after Stephen was killed and they're scattered all over the place and the church grows. And now, beautifully here we see, and a time of peace came and the church grew. In all seasons, there is growth. God is at work building his church. God is at work bringing salvation to many. You see, we could continually wonder, well, are the conditions right? Can we expect fruit now? Can we expect anything to happen? Yes. In all seasons, God is at work. In all situations, God is at work, and God is at work in bringing salvation. That doesn't mean that things will always be exactly the same. There'll be times that we can say, wow, there were loads of people who came then, and there was, there was few then, or whatever. But we can be expecting that God is at work. And as we declare, and we are his witnesses, and we proclaim his words, we can see people come and be saved. God will build his church. As he said to Peter, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. As we come into land, we've seen many things about being disciples. Disciples are witnesses. Disciples can face persecution. Disciples are meant to be part of a body. We are a body together. And we expect to see growth and see more disciples made. This wonderful last sentence gives us a sense as to how. How do we be his witnesses? How do we face persecution? How do, we, how do we love one another? How do we be this body welcoming people from all backgrounds and even people we didn't really like very much? How do we see growth come? Well, disciples live by the Spirit. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, the church increased in numbers. It's all because of the transforming power of God. It's all because of the power of the Holy Spirit at work in them. Power to witness. Power to face persecution. Power to love one another. Power to see salvation and growth coming. Fearing God, a right fear of God, a right sense of you are God, you're holy, we're living only for you, Lord. Full of his spirit. And where I want us to land, and perhaps maybe the band could come up now, is this, we are his disciples. If we're in Christ, we are his disciples. We need to fix our eyes on him. To know this right fear of the Lord. To know he is king and he's in control. He is Lord. He is holy. He is perfect. And we need to be filled with his spirit. Remember, that's what Jesus said to them in Acts 1 verses 8. You will have power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And in a moment, we're going to sing and we're going to pray. God, come fill us with your spirit. We see all that Paul was doing. We see all the church was doing. And we know, as we're told, in fear of the Lord and in the power and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, this is what led to growth. Believing him and full of his spirit. I want to have the same humility. Lord, we need you. We, we can see all these things, but we can't do it on our own. It's only in your power and in your strength. And in a moment, once we've sung, I'm going to invite us. Let's come to him. Let's be filled afresh. Might be others out there, actually, you have, as I mentioned at the start, you have been listening and, and being prodded, and God's getting your attention today because you don't know him yet. There can be opportunity for you to come and kneel before the Father 
and say, I want to follow you. 